only I have no audio because that should have made noise. Hmm. Would someone unmute and say something? Hi. Okay, got my audio working. Good deal. <laughs> um, okay, so today we're going to be talking about absolute value. And I know that this is something that people have seen before, um, or it's probably something people have seen before. So just a quick recap, like notation wise and what absolute value is doing. So if I write, to write absolute value, um, a notation for it is that we use vertical bars. So if I write absolute value of three, we put vertical bars on either side of the three. Now what absolute value does is it's gonna take, sometimes we call it the magnitude of the number, but um, if I take the absolute value of a positive number, it doesn't do anything to it. If I take the absolute value of negative five, we define that to be a positive five because what absolute value is doing is it's taking whatever's inside and we're saying if we ignore the sign on it, what is the magnitude of that number? So the magnitude of this number is five. If I take the absolute value of zero, that's zero. So the thing you wanna remember is that when you take the absolute value of a negative number, it's effectively changing the sign to make it positive. So that's kind of what's going on when we are talking numbers. So if I write something like absolute value of X is equal to five, and I want to solve that, well, this is telling me that I'm just gonna cover up this for a second. Whatever is inside of that absolute value could have been equal to five or it could have been equal to negative five because either way, the answer that I would get is five. So this is the same as saying that X could be equal to five or X could be equal to negative five. But there's another way that we use absolute value um, that definitely shows up sometimes in calculus. And that's the idea of absolute value as a distance. So if I revisit that absolute value equal to five thing for a second, and for no good reason at all, um, I choose to write the absolute value of X equal to five as the absolute value of X minus zero is equal to five. In this context, we would read that as the distance between x and zero is equal to five. And we can think about this on a number line as saying, here's zero. And I know that X is located a distance of five away from zero. So if I move out five in this direction, that would put X over here at a positive five. And if I were to move out five in this direction, that would put my X over here at a negative five. So I'd end up with two possible values because both or a distance of five away from zero. It's gonna be important for us um, over the course of calculus to understand absolute value both in its distance form and as saying, this means I can take on two possible values, either the positive or the negative version of it. So let's do a couple more examples. Um, and I'm going to do one more example before I get into the ones that are actually listed on the guided notes, because I just want to get one more in this sort of distance form. So if I wrote something like X minus three 
absolute value is equal to two, then I would read this as the distance between X and three is equal to two. And if I put that on a number line, here's three, and now the distance from three needs to be equal to two, and that's telling us where X is. So I can go out in either direction and go two in this direction, and that would put me at X equals five. And I could go in two in this direction, and that would put me at x equals one. And those are my two answers. Or if I think about it not in terms of distance, and I just think, well, notation wise, whatever's inside of that absolute value could have been a positive two, or it could have been a negative two. So I can solve this by saying, x minus three is equal to positive two, or x minus three is equal to negative two. Solving each of those out, this top one, I can add three to both sides, get x equals five. And down here, if I add three to both sides, I'm gonna get x equals one. We'll get the same answer either way. And most of the time, this is probably the, the fastest way to just show our work, get to an answer. But I think sometimes for me visually, it helps to also have this idea in the background of what's happening as a distance. Now I'm gonna launch into the guided notes. Um, so our first example here looks like 3x minus 6, absolute value of that is equal to 9. So as soon as I see absolute value, I'm already thinking in my head, I'm, I'm going to have to take into account a positive and a negative thing. So when I'm looking at this, my first move is to rewrite that statement to say, 3x minus 6 is equal to positive 9, or 3x minus 6 is equal to negative 9. Two problems for the price of one. Also, I probably should have given us some instructions. We're going to solve this. Working through here, I'm going to add 6 to both sides so that I've got 3x is equal to 15. Divide both sides by 3, and I get x is equal to 5. Thinking about it over here, when I add six to both sides, I end up with three X is equal to, what's that negative three? Did I do that right? Negative nine plus six. Yeah, I think that's good. And X is gonna be negative one. So I've got two possible answers that both solve this. How come on the, um, the first example you gave, you had to do like the x minus three equals two and for this one, you can just get the x uh, directly. Hmm. So I'm not weak. I'm not sure if this is gonna answer your question but there are two ways to work through absolute value problems. We can either think about it graphically on a number line, or we can think about it in terms of the equations. So like on this example, I did it, this, I did it the equation you weigh second and the graphing way first. Unless the problem states that we have to graph the solution, most of the time, it's probably easier to just work through the equations. Did that get at the question? Yeah, it did. Thank you. Okay, cool. You are welcome to graph to find all the answers if that feels the most comfortable for you. But usually it's messier. I just wanted everyone to know that that's kind of hiding in the background. And there will be some cases where graphing it is helpful. Um, just another kind of thing about absolute value. If you looked at this and you wanted to factor out a three, you absolutely could. Okay, I shouldn't have used absolute there, but 
Um, if you want to factor out a three, you totally could factor out a three. Um, just for consistency, I most of the time prefer to think about it as as soon as I've got that absolute value, I want to be breaking this up and considering a positive and a negative. Um, one of the or a common mistake that can happen when folks are working through these absolute value problems is to see an absolute value somewhere and immediately jump into I've got a plus and minus something. The thing is, we're, this is kind of like when we were solving equations with radicals, where we want to get the radical part by itself first and push everything to the other side of the equation before we proceed. We're going to want to do the same thing with absolute value. So before I do anything else, I want to get this absolute value block by itself, which would mean subtracting two from both sides. Once I'm here, now I know that if I were to cover this piece up, whatever's inside of the absolute value is either equal to positive one or it's equal to negative one. Now I can move on. Add three to both sides. I've got four X is equal to four or X is equal to one. Over here, if I add three to both sides, I've got four X is equal to two or X is equal to two fourths, which I'm gonna to choose to call one half. Good times. I'm gonna erase more stuff. And I am keeping an eye on the chat. Um, feel free to ask me questions, unmute yourself, slow me down. So on my next one here, I've got seven A minus one plus three is equal to one. I've got an absolute value. So before I go about solving and kind of splitting out the positive negative thing, I wanna make sure that I get the absolute value part by itself first. Well, here, when I subtract three from both sides, I'd end up with absolute value of seven A minus one is equal to negative two. And we're just gonna stop here. Absolute value takes whatever the sign is of, of what's inside of it and forces it to be a positive number. So the absolute value of this cannot be equal to negative two. There is no solution. So whenever you're working through something like this, just keep in mind that absolute value of a number is always a positive thing. So when it, if you've got absolute value is equal to something negative, it's always gonna mean there's no solution. Now we get into the fun stuff. You ready for the fun stuff? This is a terrible first example of this. I don't know why I chose it this way. Okay, it's not terrible. It's just that it's messy. So I've got two absolute value things. Okay. 
So what I really know, I cover them both up, is that whatever is inside has to be like the same number, but they could have opposite signs. So where we're gonna proceed from this, if we have two absolute value pieces, is I'm gonna think about this as giving me a four X minus five could be equal to the positive version of three X plus nine, or four X minus five could be equal to the negative version of three X plus nine. And I'm just gonna give you all a minute or so to work out on your own what you get for possible answers for X. How are we doing? We got some answers. So if I deal with this one first, doesn't really matter what side we put the X's on, but I'm going to choose to put them on the side that makes them positive. So I'm going to subtract three X from both sides. So I would end up with four X. That means I'm going to add five to both sides. So I would get four X is equal to 14 and X would be 14 over four. We could totally stop here, but if you wanted to simplify that, that 14 is seven times two. And since four is two times two, that would make that equal to seven halves. Now let's check the other one. First thing I'm gonna do is distribute in the minus. So that's gonna look like four X minus five is equal to negative three X minus nine. Again, I'm gonna move my X's to whatever side. It's gonna make them have a positive coefficient. Um, so if I, move, if I add three X to both sides, I'd have seven X. And if I add five to both sides, I'd end up with negative four. So I'm gonna get X is equal to negative four sevenths. There is a hand up, so let me take the question. Yeah. Um, I think for the first one, this was supposed to be minus 3x. So it would be 4x minus 3x. Oh, yeah. Okay. Good call. Let's rewind. I don't know why I just wrote 4x. It's like I just pretended we were doing nothing with the 3x, I think. Um, so let's subtract 3x and end up with an X over here. When I add the five, I just get 14. Cool, that number is nicer. Now, similar to when we're dealing with radicals, we wanna make sure to take a moment to check to see if both of these really work as solutions. So I'm gonna take that X equals 14 and plug it in on both sides. 
So if I plug in x equals 14 over here, that would be four times 14 minus five. And we wanna know, is that equal to plugging in 14 over here? Three times, oops, 14 plus nine. Totally fine to pull out a calculator to deal with this. I didn't bring a calculator, but luckily I have my phone and my phone can handle these numbers. So I'm looking at four times 14, it's 56. And if we subtract five, that's a 51 on this side. So I got 51 over here. And we wanna know, is that equal to three times 14 plus a nine? I also get a 51, we're good. 14 is a solution. Now let's check the negative four sevenths. And because I think we could all use practice with fractions, we're going to work out the plugging in negative four sevenths by hand. Good times. Um, I need a little bit of space. So I'm just going to put up here one of our solutions we already know is that x equals 14. And now I want to check the negative four sevenths. So we're going to have absolute value of four times negative four over seven minus five. And we want to know, is that equal to absolute value of three times negative four over seven plus nine? So over here, that's going to give me negative 16 sevenths. And because I want the negative, because I know I'm going to need to get a common denominator, I'm going to go ahead and multiply that five by seven over seven. So I'll just stick it in here for myself. Seven over seven. Five times seven, that's 35. So I've got minus 35 over seven. Well, negative 16 minus 35, since they're both negative, we can treat that like addition. Um, that makes sure our final result works out to be negative. And 16 and 35, that's going to give me a 40 plus 11. So that is 51 over seven. And we want to know, is that equal to what's over here? Well, over here, I've got three times negative four, so that's a negative 12 sevenths. And I'm gonna need a common denominator again, so that nine will get multiplied by seven over seven. Nine times seven is 63. So I can treat this like 63 minus 12, and I'm gonna get 51 over seven. And because these are both inside of absolute value, they are indeed both the same. Good times. Should we do one more before we take a little break? Actually, you know what I'm gonna do? Um, so just because I think it is helpful to be able to check your work when, um, you know, maybe it's midnight and you're studying on your own and you don't have anyone to phone a friend and see what they did. Um, just another tool that you should have in your toolkit is some way to find solutions to this thing. And one of the ways that I would suggest is an easy tool we've got on the internet is Desmos. Why do I think it's easy? I just think it's friendly. Um, there are lots of other like algebra equation solver things, but Desmos is pretty friendly if, and it's always a good idea to be able to connect doing things like this 
to what it might look like graphically. So what I'm gonna share my screen and pull up Desmos. You're welcome to play along if you want. Um, but in Desmos, what I'm gonna do is pretend that each of these equations is really like a graph. And what we've done by setting them equal to each other is we're, is this is equivalent to finding the intersection points of two functions. So I'm gonna type these in and in Desmos, you can type in ABS for absolute value. Um, so I'm gonna do ABS of four X minus five. And you'll notice the graphs of absolute values kind of look like these. And I've got Y equals absolute value of three X plus nine. And just from graphing it right there, it doesn't look like we're seeing solutions, but if we scroll way out, we can see that there are a couple of places where these graphs intersect. So one of them looks like it's way out here. Where? Oh, that's right. At 14 comma 51. That's the same X value that we got before. And the 51 is what we got when we plugged that X in. So that matches the work that we did by hand. Um, Desmos kind of already looks for points that thinks you might be interested in. So if you notice, it's showing me four gray dots. It's showing me dots specifically on the red graph because that's the one that I have highlighted right now. If I switch and click on the blue graph, it switches and shows me dots on the blue graph. It's already gonna look for things like intersection points, maximums, minimums, and the X and Y intercepts. So if it's a gray dot and you click on it, it's going to tell you what the point is. So I'm going to scroll back in a little bit to figure out which of those gray dots, um, which of those gray dots was my intersection point. And there it is right there. Now notice Desmos didn't give me that as a nice fraction like we wanted. So you could pull out the calculator and check well, is negative four sevenths the same as negative 0.571? What I'm gonna do because I've already got Desmos open is I'm just gonna add a third graph that says X equals negative four over seven. And yep, it is perfectly on that intersection point right there. And notice when you type it in, when I typed in X equals negative four sevenths, Desmos even gave me the decimal approximation right there. So we are totally on track. We got the right answers. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. But it's a good way. Um, it's a good way to be able to check things if you are not sure, if you're not feeling super confident about your answers. Um, it's a good, good way to check, check things if nobody else is around. Um, it's about 10. So how about if we take a five minute break, come back at 10.05, and then we'll keep going through the guided notes.
Okay, I'm back. Um, oh, I'm missing an absolute value, but well, I'm back. So I wanna do um, one more example where we've got two sets of absolute values. And this one, I'm gonna work through two different ways. Um, but gonna start with that same idea that whatever's inside of those absolute values, they either have to be exactly the same thing or opposite signs of the same thing. If I come over here, that's gonna mean that x plus three, either that's equal to x plus eight, the positive version of it, or x plus three is equal to the negative version of x plus eight. We got a problem over here. As if I subtract x from both sides, this would say three is equal to eight, which isn't gonna work out. So this one actually doesn't give us a solution this time. This one over here, on the other hand, once I distribute that minus sign, I'm gonna have x plus three is equal to negative x minus eight. So if I add x to both sides, and I promise I'll do it this time, if I add x to both sides, I get a two x over here. And, on the, and then when I subtract three from both sides, I have a negative 11, which means, that I can rewrite that to say X is equal to negative 11 over two. And that's gonna be my only solution to this. We could definitely confirm our answer um, by graphing that in Desmos. And we would see that there's only one place where those two curves intersect. But I also wanna take this back to that idea of this meaning something about distance. So to step back just a little bit in terms of um, distance, if I had two numbers on the number line, so let's say that, I, that this was four and this was nine, and I wanted to find the distance between them. Yeah, yeah, I know it's five, but if I wanted to find the distance between them, what arithmetic would you do? to actually get the five. You can type it in the chat. No one's sure what to do? Cool. Or, something's not working with your keyboard, also cool. Or you're, you're on your phone. How the heck are you gonna type in the chat and watch me at the same time? I get it. But if I wanna know how far apart four and nine are, I'm gonna do nine minus four, yeah? Okay, I know y'all thought it was like some sort of trick question or something. So if this were a hundred, and this were 500, and I wanted to know how far apart they are, I'm gonna do 500 minus 100. I'm gonna figure out how far apart they are. I'm gonna subtract the two numbers. Well, that idea of subtraction is kind of critical here. This is the same as writing x, minus negative three. And this one is the same as writing X minus negative eight. And I bring that up to continue my theme of, there are a lot of equivalent expressions for things. And one of the sort of talents that you can cultivate is recognizing different versions of the same thing algebraically, because there are definitely gonna be times where it's more useful 
to think about that x plus three as x minus negative three, because this is telling me I have a distance between x and negative three. Well, if I were to plot these things on a number line, and let me just make this another color. Hopefully it'll show up. Um, so if I were thinking about these on a number line, what this says out loud is the distance between X and negative three is the same as the distance between X and negative eight. So if you were like a super visual person here, I could put negative three down and I could put negative eight down. And this says wherever we put X, it's the same distance from each of these two numbers. So I'm gonna share my screen for a second. I just had this thought, it's probably dumb, but I just had this thought. And if you are brave enough to use the, uh, let me go with this. If you're brave enough to use the annotate tools, here's my number line. I'm gonna put on the, let's put on negative eight, mark that on the number line and put on negative three and mark that on the number line and open up your annotate tools and use one of the stamps to tell me where X should go. If it's gonna be the same distance from negative three as it is from negative eight. Um, to get to the annotate tools up at the top of your screen, um, there's probably a drop down thing that says video something. And let me uh, let's see. And you can use a stamp or you can use the drawing tools. And I think it's gonna hide the names of annotators so that everybody can freely put things on there and say nothing. I like the heart. Totally, we got a green bar, we got a star, nicely done. So yeah, we're looking for the place that is in the X value that's gonna be an equal distance between negative eight and negative three is that number that's gonna be right in the middle. So that's where X should live. Just because I'm bringing lots of different things together here, if I wanted to find the value that's right in the middle of negative eight and negative three, we call that the average. So I know that that X value is going to be the average of negative eight and negative three, which I would get by adding them together and dividing by two. And guess what? That is the negative 11 over two that we just got. Would you actually do this to solve the problem? Heck no. You're just gonna do the algebra over there, right? Um, this is more about just having different ways to think through a problem. And if these were anything messier than that, for sure, we're just gonna work through the algebra. But I think it's kind of cool that there are different ways we can think about it. I'm gonna erase it. We'll do another one and we'll just stick to the algebra this time. Um, so the last example here on the guided notes for P, 
I'm looking at 2x plus 3 plus a 2 is equal to 2. Back to kind of the first few that we were doing. If I'm looking at an absolute value, I want to get that piece by itself first. So I've got 2x plus 3. We'll get that piece by itself first. If I subtract 2 from both sides, I get 0. Now, there's nothing wrong with a 0. And also, I know that it makes people nervous when they get a 0 somewhere. But there's nothing wrong with a 0, except when that 0 shows up in the denominator. Nothing wrong with the 0 here. We can kind of think about doing our thing where I take this and I set it equal to the positive version or the negative version, except that zero doesn't have a positive self and negative self. Zero is just zero. So this gives me only one answer. This says 2x plus 3 is equal to zero, or 2x is equal to negative 3, x is equal to negative 3 halves. So if it works out to be equal to a zero, we're only going to end up with one answer. OK. So I want to do a couple of things with our remaining time today. I want to get a few more examples of solving nonlinear inequalities. And if we've got time, maybe we'll push into um, the stuff that we're going to talk about in lesson Q. But I want to revisit what we were doing yesterday because it really is such a big deal in calculus and we use it all over the place. Um, so we're going to revisit from yesterday. We're going to solve and write our answers in interval notation. I don't know how everybody is feeling. I'm gonna give you a warm up problem and let you try it on your own and give you a couple minutes. Um, so I'm also gonna give it to you already factored. <laughs> So let's have um, x minus 3 times eight minus two x. And I want that to be less than or equal to zero. So I've got x minus three times the quantity eight minus two x. And I wanna know where is that less than or equal to zero?
How are we doing? Would anyone like more time? I would. You got it. Okay. So we know we have an inequality. It's not linear. It's already factored for us, which is nice. Um, so I'm going to get a number line going and the things that I'll put on the number line are whatever values of X make one of the factors equal to zero. So if we plug in three here, that would make the factor zero. And if we plug in four here, that would make that factor equal to zero. Next thing I'm looking for are some test numbers. So maybe I would go zero, 3.5, five. Arbitrary choices, you're welcome to choose different test numbers. Well, if I plug in zero, I'd have zero minus three times eight minus zero. And overall, that's gonna be negative. I plug in 3.5, I'd have 3.5 minus three. Well, 3.5 is bigger than three. So 3.5 minus three is gonna give me a positive value. Eight minus two times 3.5. Okay, I'm gonna do the 3.5 times two. That would give me seven. And eight minus seven should be positive. So I'd get a positive in here. I plug in five, five minus three is two, which is positive. And five times two is 10, eight minus 10 is negative, which means overall that would give me a negative. Now I'm gonna look at, do I want brackets or parentheses on my final answer? Since this has an or equal to, I know I'm gonna be using brackets. And since it's less than zero, I want the parts that are negative. So I want the negative part, filled in circle, filled in circle, the other negative part. Putting that together, I would write that as negative infinity to three with a bracket, union bracket four to positive infinity with parentheses. How are we feeling? Feeling pretty good? Okay. Um, good times. One more of these just to keep our practice up. Um, and I'm gonna go with 
x minus five divided by two x plus one times x minus one. And I want this whole thing to be greater than or equal. Hmm. To zero. Sure, why not? Um, so uh, we'll do this one together in a second, but I don't want to ignore the stuff that's coming through the chat. So I'm just going to pause for a second. Um, it is totally fine to do these problems without using a number line. Um, it's totally fine to use a chart. It's totally fine if you know what the graph looks like to just use the graph. As long as you have a method that is working for you consistently and you're getting the right answers, I don't care if you ever draw a number line on your paper. I happen to think that it's a nice way to sort of keep track of my personal, uh, to like keep track of my thoughts. Um, but you do, if you have another way that's working for you, go for it. Okay, I wanted to do this one together. Since we have division this time, we definitely need to be looking at what values of x would make this equal to zero or undefined, meaning one of my bottom factors is equal to zero. But we want to make sure that we think about those restrictions on the variable and we're not actually going to plug in the values of x that make the denominator zero. When I put this on a number line, that means that from the bottom, I'm looking at an x equal to negative one, x equal to one, x equal to five from the top. So if I put those in order from left to right, it's gonna look like negative one half, one, five. I'm gonna go ahead and take care of my open and closed circles right away. Whatever else is going on, the negative one half and the one both need to be open circles because they're in the denominator. I need to somehow remind myself we're not actually including those values. But the five, we are going to include, it is going to make part of this equal to zero. Now I'm coming in to choose my test numbers. Well, I have a negative and a positive, so I'm gonna stick zero right in there. Between one and five, I don't know, how about two? Something bigger than five? How about 10? Something less than negative one half? How about negative one? That is a whole lot of stuff to plug in. I know I mentioned this yesterday, but this might be the place where I think about putting a chart together um, just to keep track of things, but it doesn't, you don't have to. Um, we can just go through it. Also, don't get hung up on finding the actual values. I don't care what the value is when we plug in negative one. I only care whether the result is positive or negative. So if I just think about it piece by piece, plugging in the negative one, when I plug in a negative one on top, I've got negative one minus five. So that's gonna give me a negative on top. In the denominator, when I plug in a negative one, two times negative one is negative two, plus one, I'm still negative. Negative one minus one, also still negative. So overall, I'm negative right here. Between negative one half and zero, or negative one half and one, we chose zero. Well, if I plug in zero on top, zero minus five would give me a negative. Zero plus one is positive and zero minus one is negative. So overall, that's gonna give me a positive. If I plug in a two, 
I know I'm doing this a little bit fast, but two minus five, two minus five, that's negative. Two times two is four, four plus one, that's positive. And two minus one, also positive. Overall, that's gonna give me a negative. When I plug in 10, 10 minus five is positive. 20 plus one, that's positive. 10 minus one, also positive. Overall, that's gonna be positive. When I go to write my final answer, I'm thinking about, okay, I need all the places that are positive or greater than zero. I'm looking for this chunk in here and this chunk out here. For this piece, because we can't actually plug in the values that make us divide by zero, this one's going to get parentheses on both sides. Negative one half comma one. Union. Five to infinity, but this time we are going to include the five. Good times. Pausing in case there are questions. In that case, want to kind of get a jump start on lesson Q. So, lesson Q, we are looking at inequalities with absolute value. We're mixing it all up. Um, so I wanted to start off just by thinking about what it means when I'm looking at the difference between like absolute value of x is equal to seven versus the absolute value of x is less than seven versus the absolute value of x is greater than seven. In order to do this, I'm gonna go back to that idea of distance and thinking about graphing it, and then we'll bring it back around to how do we actually do the algebra. Well, this says, because there isn't anything else with the x, I can think about this as saying, the distance between x and zero is equal to seven, or, the distance between x and zero is less than seven. And down here, the distance between x and zero is greater than seven. On a number line, if I'm saying that the distance between x and zero is equal to seven, I'm putting zero on there, and I'm going out seven in either direction, I'm saying, okay, X is negative seven or X is positive seven. When I read this one, the distance between X and zero is less than seven. Well, now that's not just giving me a single value for X, that's telling me that if I go out seven in either direction, wherever X is, it's closer to zero than those boundary edges of the distance of seven. So X can be anywhere in here. It can't actually be, it's not an or equal to, so I'm kind of thinking about this as soft edges 
or parentheses or open circles. But this is telling me that x is between negative 7 and 7, or in interval notation, negative 7 to positive 7. This bottom one here, when I read it as the distance between x and 0 is greater than 7. So again, I'm coming back to this 0. I'm going out 7 in either direction. But the distance x is further away from 0 than that, which means x is either out here or x is out there. Both of them, again, are going to have soft edges or um, parentheses because we don't have the or equal to piece. So when I've got that absolute value of x or the distance is bigger than something, we're pushed out to the sides, which means we've got sort of two different paths to follow. Either x is less than negative 7 or x is greater than positive 7. So our key takeaway here um, is in terms of how we're going to push through the algebra is that if we've got an equate, if we have an inequality and we've got that absolute value piece by itself, if that absolute value piece is less than something, then we're going to be close in, right? We're going to be closer than which is going to lead us to solving something that looks like this. And if I've got my absolute value piece by itself and it's greater than something, then I know that I'm on the edges. So I should be looking for two separate pieces. And we will actually solve inequalities and stuff tomorrow. I just wanted to give a little preview of where we're going. Clock says we got seven minutes left. Questions about this, questions about homework, questions about life in Davis. Oh, I have a quick question. Um, do you recommend doing the like dorm renters insurance? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I am not a worrier, um, but I'm, I'm a proponent of insurance for my car and like the, the thing to think about insurance is it's really there if something catastrophic happened, right? So yeah, there's a little bit of you're hedging your bets about if something catastrophic happened. I paid for the renter's insurance for my son. We opted in. I don't know. I got not a lot. I, I don't have a lot to offer there. Um, one of my best friends works in the insurance industry. So I think I'm a little bit jaded because I hear her horror stories of stuff that goes wrong. Um, like, you know, when you're thinking about how much car insurance you need, sure, but then you don't imagine that what if your car bumps into a fire hydrant and then the water is leaking out and you've actually now flooded two houses on the street, right? So I hear like all the, the worst case scenarios um, in insurance land from my friend. So yeah, I'm, but at the same time, I would ask around, like I would ask the PACs if anyone has ever actually had to file an insurance claim on their dorm, right? Because I'm thinking, what are you really insuring yourself against in case there's a fire in the dorm? In my eight, how long have I been on this campus? Uh, 17 years on this campus. There's been one fire that I'm aware of, and it happened 
in family housing where they have full kitchens. Um, you know, theft, theft would probably like petty theft would be the most likely thing to happen in the dorms, I think. You know, you left your door unlocked or your roommate did, or you left something in the, you know. Um, so if you are going to do the rental insurance, I would definitely, um, I would definitely look at what it's actually going to cover in terms of theft, because I think that's the most likely thing to happen. Um, yeah. Okay. Other questions in there. Yeah, I probably don't think it probably don't take anything valuable. Um, and the equitable access for the textbooks. So I don't know if I mentioned this. Maybe I mentioned this in office hours to some folks. Um, if you know that your instructor is going to require you to use the like online homework that's integrated into the textbook, then generally the inclusive access is a better deal. If you are not going to have to use some sort of integrated homework thing for the inclusive access, and if you're paying for books yourself, then you're probably better off finding cheaper books online. One nice thing about inclusive access is it does build a financial aid, right? So um, like that, that's a nice pro of inclusive access. You also don't even, you don't have to worry about it. You just, you click my bookshelf in every Canvas page and your book is there, right? Um, there are also some instructors who they are kind of opposed to inclusive access. So they intentionally make sure you don't need it, right? So I would say if you're taking classes like, um, if you're taking chemistry in the fall, not workload chem, but if you're taking chem 2A, then inclusive access is probably worth it. They will be using the integrated online homework package um, and that textbook is not cheap. If you are taking biz in the fall, you might wanna check because some of the instructors use an actual textbook and some of them use a free textbook. And on the math side, um, for the 17 series, some of the instructors have required reading assignments in the textbook. You do not have to have inclusive access, but you will need the actual textbook, right? So if you can find it cheaper than what they're charging you for inclusive access, one of the things to keep in mind, especially for like math and chemistry, is you're going to use it for three quarters. So when you're looking at that sticker price on a used book, remember that's like over three quarters, not just one quarter that you're going to use it. Um, how do we it, find out? Yeah. Oh, how do we find out which like what book or what platform they're going to be using? So it if they have their Canvas up already, then that's really your best bet to find it on the math side. Um, there's a department required textbook, but people can opt into the different homework platforms. So web work is free, web assign is not. But everybody for chemistry uses the online homework. So, and they actually, they use it for the workload class too. So um, there's kind of no way around the online stuff for chemistry. Um, just checking. Okay, so there are a couple of homework questions. So I will hang out and answer those homework questions. It is 1045. Oh, well, I should probably should have stopped.